Cool. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so, SRE, small organizations. Uh, for anyone that is not quite familiar, SRE is uh, site reliability engineering in this case. Uh, for me, it's, it's a bit of a, a movement of the DevOps community, the methodologies, a, a bit of a different take on things uh, that's come out from Google for, I don't know, more than a decade or something now. Um, there's a few really, really interesting things that make SRE stand out away from DevOps and some of the traditional ops and whatever other sorts of disciplines that go hand in hand with, with these types of uh, roles and parts of a business. For SRE in particular, uh, there's a lot of focus on automation and taking people out of standard processes uh, across the, the normal function of a business. Uh, the big way that we do that is by getting visibility on the execution environments and the, the systems that we're, we're looking to keep up and running and available for customers and all of our intended audience. So what we do is we, we take existing processes and systems, we call them toil. Uh, they're the things that people do over and over again. They're the sorts of stuff that we want to automate them because people shouldn't have to be doing these things. People burn out, things are repetitive. It's just not fun. Uh, and while we want to do all of these things, there's usually way too much, and we have to try and work out how we decide on which ones to do, when do we do them, who should do them, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we want to be a bit more informed when we start to make these decisions. And then as we grow as a business, when we're not so small anymore, we want our teams to be a bit more self-sufficient, a bit more autonomous, let them move at their own pace, and do the things that they need to do. So then in a smaller organization specifically, SRE can be a bit of a different topic. It's, it's not the same as what the Google definition is, and it doesn't necessarily incorporate what is in the SRE books, the handbook, whatever it is. There's a lot of topics that uh, brought up as a part of SRE, and they don't necessarily apply in a smaller business, primarily just because there's not enough people. There's not enough body capacity to actually get things done in that way. And this is one of the big things that I found in my experience of leading SRE teams and starting them and just trying to get these positive things happening in a business. We need to focus on the right things at the right time to get the best benefits and accomplish what we need to accomplish. So to do that, I kind of came up with these five just basic principles. Uh, I'm sure other people have come up with similar stuff. Um, these are the ones that I found work really well for the teams that I've led. And they, they work really well in a smaller organization where not everybody has just one role. You, you have a lot of things that you move between. You're doing multiple things. It's not just narrow focused. It's very broad and encompasses a lot of stuff. The first that I pick is everything should be reproducible. And this is very much a uh, DevOps kind of a, a concept. Uh, we, we think about things like infrastructure as code. Uh, so we want to have all of our uh, servers, our load balances, everything in between, and everything outside of that. Have everything configured somewhere. Doesn't matter what system you use, Puppet, Ansible, Chef, Terraform, or a combination of those things, whichever one you're happy with. Uh, and then we put them in version control. We review them. We share them. You know, it's, it's just if something goes wrong or if we want to build more, we can reproduce it without a huge amount of effort. Next part is not trying to be perfect. Uh, 
it doesn't matter if things are a little bit hacky sometimes. You know, we keep track of that. We don't want to make it unmaintainable. Uh, but not just hounding those 10 lines of code for 10 days until it's absolutely perfect because it will never be absolutely perfect. So we iterate, we, we keep plugging away. We think about whether or not we're still getting any benefit from changing. Uh, and then we move on when it's time. We also have to keep in mind that toil is inevitable. So people will always have to be involved at some stage in any of these processes. So even if we do have infrastructure as code and we can bring up servers, no worries, we still might need people to run those, which is fine. Uh, but if we plan from a disaster recovery perspective, then we know that things work fine. We know that we can bring them up in the event of something catastrophic. Or if we, say, run things in a couple of regions around the globe, wherever, different data centers, and we have code that we can use to bring up a, a data center when something goes wrong, then if we want to expand, we can use the same code to add something new. So there's, there's multiple benefits to, to some of these concepts. The, the last big point for the reproducibility is then documentation. So just having the code, knowing where it is, doesn't necessarily provide us everything we need. We still need to have the documentation. It could be a run book or a playbook where we can say for, for certain repositories, for certain uh, code in, infrastructure repos, these are, this is how you run it. This is how you prepare your environment. This is where you get secrets or whatever other config you might need. And if we do things with DR, we're constantly, well, occasionally rerunning these things. So we tweak them over time. We keep them up to date. And we make sure that everyone is, is across and able to contribute and, and keep things running. The second point is about automation. And Personally, I've, I've always been a massive fan of automating things. I've written many systems that integrate with Jenkins to create pipelines on the fly that have all these jobs that do all these things in all these different ways. And it's just because I didn't want to run a shell script. It's, it's a little bit crazy sometimes, but uh, not everything should be automated that way. For instance, uh, we wouldn't want to automate managing databases unless we really know what's in those databases and occasionally we don't mind data going away, just because. Uh, and so again, toil is often uh, there, but it can be avoidable. And we just have to remember that it doesn't have to be perfect or anything like that. There might also be some things or processes that you might want to automate, but they might happen once a year. So it's not really worth automating those ones. Because once something's automated, we still need to maintain it. We need to make sure that it's actually going to do what it needs to do when it gets triggered to do it. And if that happens once a year, but it's broken, we're probably not going to remember how to actually work with the system, whether that's test it, debug it, run it in dev, whatever. The third point is that security should not be ignored. Uh, this is mostly because a lot of the preparation for security type uh, topics can really be dealt with quite simply at the, at the outset of a project or some body of work. For instance, uh, having the right coding standards uh, inside of a software project, uh, we might have a library that filters input automatically. And as long as whenever anybody is writing code that deals with input uses that library, then it's going to be filtered. If we don't start off with that, then there might be hundreds of places where we're pulling uh, user input, but it's not being filtered. So if we then added a library later, it's really hard to retrofit that into all of the different unique cases across an entire code base. 
This type of thing applies to systems as well, uh, especially with infrastructure as code. Uh, so having some of these types of things already planned and implemented up front can save a lot of time. Simple is better than magical. By this, I really mean that things should be explicit or it, it, there shouldn't, somebody who's looking at a system shouldn't have to guess at what something is, the name or the description or something about that system should be explicit about what it does. If, if you have to have a lookup table to see that service XYZ maps to sending emails, that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, as humans, we all like to name things the way that we like or give them labels that are funny or whatever it might be. It doesn't lend itself well to being a nice, maintainable, visible, easy to use system. Not necessarily. This is also especially useful in an onboarding process. Uh, having a new dev join a team with a lot of systems that have a lot of weird names, it's going to take a long time for them to get up to speed with how they all fit together, why they're named a certain way, and just understanding the language within the business itself. It also helps with uh, breaking down assumptions. If people don't have to assume that something means a certain thing just because of some sort of convention, then you're less likely to run into problems. The final one is that visibility is key, access is not. The biggest part to this is primarily around uh, production access, really. And by production access, I mostly mean uh, SSH onto production infrastructure. Uh, it's such a common request for just developers to be able to log into a, a machine somewhere, or I want to look at the logs, or I want to see a, a profile of this process, or whatever it might be. But really, that in itself is very dangerous. And there's a lot of tools that mean you don't need to do that, because you can get all that data to come out somewhere else into a separate system, and then your devs or anyone else in your team can browse and massage or do whatever they need to do to get the information that they're trying to get. This is the same for monitoring and logs. So different processes, uh, different log methods, just getting them all into, into the appropriate systems and uh, looking at the documentation and all the rest of it, uh, get a lot of benefit without having to just open the doors to everyone willy-nilly. Uh, an easy way to think about this type of concept is uh, referring to the production infrastructure as uh, cattle, not pets. That way there's a bit, a bit more attachment to things. It's less about what's happening on specific machines and more just about aggregated data about system state at specific points in time. So with those five concepts or principles, uh, I try and have a slightly different take on the SRE and DevOps type of ecosystem. Uh, I don't think there's really a right or wrong answer. Um, there's there's strange way that these can be applied and implemented, but I don't think you need to go very uh, narrow down this uh, textbook. Uh, application. Really it's all about just having the right visibility on what's happening in a system, being able to understand all of the data that's coming out, and then being able to use that data to inform the decision making process. If you know that particular subsets of your system are behaving a certain way and that causes downstream issues somewhere else, if you have the data to back that up, you can then take that as a way to say, hey, we need to do work on this system here because of these cascading problems. And with the data, it's a lot easier to convince people who make those bigger planning decisions to say, yep, do that work. The good thing about 
SRE as a whole in terms of what is in the textbook, it was put together by some very smart people and there's a lot of really interesting things that they talk about, uh, things like uh, error rates uh, which or error budgets as well. Um, and you, combining these with things like uh, SLAs and uh, service level, level objectives, there's, there's a lot of visibility around the data that you get out of systems that then helps that decision making process. That's all. So. Okay, thank you very much, Ellen. Um, just a quick announcement. If um, Alex or Andrew are here, could they please come up to the front? Oh, there's one. <laughs> okay, that's cool.